All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to If It Ain't About the Money, um, How to Monetize Your Business as a Creative. So my name is Tiffany Latrice. I am the founder and executive director of Tila Studios, also working with National Black Arts um, as the artistic director to present to you this program in partnership with The Gathering Spot. Super excited to have three people on this panel who I've worked with um, and have the honor of knowing for some time. They are incredible creatives who have pivoted their business um, despite all the effects of COVID. Um, so I'm excited to have them with us tonight. I'm sure you're gonna learn so, so much. Um, so before we jump in, I actually wanna introduce them and read their bios because I feel like when creatives read their bios, they skim over all the good stuff. So you really need to know who these lovely people are. So first and foremost, we have the beautiful Imani Ellis, who is the founder of uh, the Creative Collective NYC as well as CultureCon. Imani Ellis is the founder of CultureCon and the Creative Collective NYC, a community and creative agency dedicated to facilitating brave spaces for multicultural creatives. The CC's in signature event is CultureCon, a conference dedicated to creatives of color. Past speakers include Tracy Ellis Ross, uh, Will Smith, Regina King, Lena Waithe, Spike Lee, like, wow, like all-star lineup. Um, they also work with in a work as an impactful creative agency, ideating creative strategies that resonate and bridges the gap between brands and multicultural creatives. She was named 2020 Diversity Champion by Adweek, and Imani has been recognized by Forbes as a visionary and a 2019 event innovator. Join me in welcoming Imani Ellis. So excited to have you here. Um, and we also have Dr. Ashley Emil, filmmaker and founder of Timber House Films. He's been doing this work for five years. He has been featured in Sheen Magazine, Voyage ATL, and AJC News. He has worked with Fortune 500 companies such as Home Depot, Lincoln Electric, as well as small businesses and nonprofit organizations such as Women of Project Management, Tila Studios, and National Black Arts Festival. Our last and esteemed guest is Carol Rose, who is incredible. She is an Atlanta-based photographer and graphic designer. She's originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Carol studied visual design at the Art Institute of Atlanta. Since childhood, she has been drawn to photographing people candidly and genuinely. Due to her being present and active in her passions, Carol has built connections and worked with incredible influencers um, and brands such as the Village Market ATL, Blavity, XO Nicole, Will Packer Media, Tila Studios, and celebrating others through photography. Photography led her to start Color Work, a photography and design company. The expression and energy of others is what inspires her to create bold and joyful images. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed guests. So I want to go ahead and just jump into this very juicy conversation. Uh, when Brianna reached out to me about this, you know, I kind of like paused because I knew COVID kind of shook us all up, um, especially as creatives in the gig economy. Um, we depend a lot on freelance work. And with us, like not being able to gather in person, you know, all of those types of opportunities dropped. I mean, I know for me, like 50% of my opportunities completely declined in March, which kind of, you know, made me a little nervous. Um, so I really want to direct my first question to Imani. Imani, you had two major events planned. Um, this would have been the fourth year of CultureCon with an experience in Atlanta, your hometown, and culminating in New York City, both of which you decided to cancel. Now that you're launching creative curriculum, creative curriculum that starts this Saturday with a stellar lineup, how did you pivot to this program and continue to grow your community, which is now at 100 plus K followers? Yeah, I mean, Tiff, I was in a similar boat as you. I think I kind of uh, just had to pause. Um, for me, I try not to do knee jerk reactions. So I think a lot of things were happening and a lot of things were being said. And when we think about kind of what we're going to do, we like to start the conversation and let our community finish the conversation. So 
Personally, I was following sports and politics. America's built on sports and politics. So I looked at the Democratic Convention, I looked at the Olympics, and I looked at the NBA, and I was like, okay, if they're pushing the Olympics to July of next year, and think about all the advertising that goes into the Olympics, we probably are going to have to postpone. And once I was able to kind of look at that and think, you know, if, if the Olympics are postponing, then it's not the biggest deal, you know, if we're prioritizing um, safety and postponing as well. So we kind of just like took it as it came. And then we just did a poll and we asked our base, like, what do you all want more of? Do you want virtual happy hours? Do you want workshops? And they said they wanted skill-based workshops. And so that's how we kind of came up with creative curriculum. Um, Cause I feel like when you are really working with your community, you're not making these decisions alone. Um, and by the time we announced that we officially had canceled, everyone was thanking us for putting their safety first. So it just felt like the best thing to do. Awesome. I mean, I think like running a conference is such a hard thing to do. And so are you reimagining the way you're going to envision CultureCon moving forward? Will it still have the same format? Or do you think this kind of creative curriculum um, is kind of your, your way forward? It's interesting. I think we definitely can't ever go back 100% to how it was. I feel like now there's going to be a digital component to almost everything that we do. Um, but I also think, you know, it really, we really have to follow what the health protocols are. So if they say you can't gather 4,000 people, which they probably will say, I think conferences are like at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of priorities. And so um, for us, you know, if that means smaller gatherings, we were born in my living room with 10 people. So we're used to, you know, having intimate gatherings. So if it's going back to more intimate gatherings, um, I think we'll grow wherever we're planted. But I don't know, there's something kind of refreshing with not having the answer and kind of just being like, let me just kind of see where the world goes and not have to kind of think that I'm going to know, you know, where COVID is going to take us. Because at this point, I've just had to relinquish control. And there's something about like, even that SZA album, it's like, just let it go. And, you know, you cannot control everything. And that's been kind of refreshing to me, honestly. Well, I'm happy that's been refreshing to you. It's been stressing me out. <laughs> you gotta find, you gotta find the silver lining. Like control what you can control. It's a serenity prayer. Yes, it really is though. And I, I'm happy that you were able to pivot. And it felt so natural, genuine, and authentic to your brand. And I think that's just why you've been steadily able to grow. And still, like I saw the lineup this morning. Incredible, you know, just what you're about to do on Saturday. So congratulations on that. If you guys haven't seen it, go check it out, sign up, snag your ticket. It's so important for you to be there. Um, and I think it's just really dope what you're doing. And so I wanted to turn it over to Arshley. Like since you're gathering people, Imani, which is incredible, Arshley, you're shooting people. Like you are a filmmaker through and through. That is what you do. Um, and I read, I remember on Facebook, maybe a couple months ago, I read, you're like, this has been the best year yet. <laughs> We have record sales, we've had record clients, we've been getting this money at Timberhouse Femin Photo. And when I read that, I was like, oh, yes, this is so exciting. And so for those who are filmmakers um, and content creators on this call, I really want you to speak to that and like talk about, did you adjust your rates? How did you attract clients? And how did you attribute uh, to still growing your business despite what's been going on? I would take all the credit if I could, but now it's, it's a lot of grace, prayer, and faith because I probably quit a million times in the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. Like I came from Africa, had this big shoot. I'm like, oh man, we're gonna we're gonna make some money, and I can't wait to show the world. And boom, COVID hits. I had I had some contracts with some friends. They know who they are. <laughs> They're watching right now, and um, it 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 was broken. I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't go to the actual place and shoot because of COVID. They're like, no, you gotta wait. I'm like, okay. I'm, and we just bought a house, we just had a baby. I'm like, God, how are we gonna do this? So besides grace and prayer, I think it, it goes back to putting down the roots five years ago when I started. And you you asked if our rates went down. Actually, we went up because it was so demanding. I mean, I worked with you, I worked with I worked with Carol, I worked with some other folks on um, the NBA F. And the list goes on. It, it got to the point where I got calls every single day. And 
it was cool, <laughs> but at the, in the same in the same breath, it was it was taxing. But I, I I have to admit, this is the best year because I have my baby girl. Yes, because I bought my house, but our business went up and, and it's, it's, it continues to go up. So for any filmmaker out there, any photographer, you can do it. Just put it in the work, grind. And it's crazy because even in the midst of COVID, I was giving free shoots. I was just highlighting different artists or just different people. Um, I went to California with Tiffany and we we're in Inglewood and we just walked up to, you know, to some people say, hey, you want some pictures? They wanted it, we took it. And, and I think it's about giving back too. They're not getting caught up in, I know it's, uh, the titles, if they ain't about the money, but it's also giving back to the culture, giving back to our people. Yeah, I think a lot of what you do and your mythology is a lot um, that I've just been really taking a deep dive into cooperative economics. And I think, you know, how do we exchange resources beyond money and how do we build community um, in exchange for labor, our intellectual property um, and things like that, that we have to be able to contribute to each other. And I think that is what really builds and sustain us and grow us beyond just the financial exchange, which sometimes may not always be available. Um, sorry if I'm a far away, if you can hear me. Uh, and so I think that's just really dope that you've been able to do that. And Carol, I just wanted to talk to you because like, I always see you at events. You are the event queen. Uh, you always capture black joy so beautifully. Uh, that is your skill set. You really are able to capture those intimate moments and not being able to gather in COVID. Um, just really wanted to just see how you pivoted and how you created color work and are your offerings still the same? Do you still see your business doing well? And how have you juggled that? Um, the same as um, Dr. Emil. Um, actually, I uh, raised my prices um, since COVID has happened. And I transitioned. I think this is the year of pivot. Um, um, you have to pivot for your business to last. I think all of us have done that. I was, you know, event, event, event. Um, I invested in my community by investing in education and learning um, a different technique. So now I do more lifestyle. Um, so I kind of changed it up, which I, I love doing lifestyle as well. So and at the same time, I would say this last year, I would say was a phenomenal year for me. It was just like um, booking after booking and people reaching out to me. I was just shocked and amazed, which made me look at look at my business and say, hey, I need to get my systems in place. I need to get everything together. So this year was a year where I got everything together in order. Like when someone books with me, they instantly get an email. Um, I can send them in, like everything is cohesive. So I invested in myself. I invested in my community at the same time. And um, I learned different things. So that's kind of how I pivoted in this year. Yeah, and can you drop some of those systems and processes that you've implemented? Uh, well, one of my favorites that I'm using right now is um, HoneyBook. I think it's okay. amazing. Um, I'm using HoneyBook. I'm using um, Calendly. Cal How do you pronounce it? Calendly. Yeah. <laughs> So and I'm and I'm really just getting hands on with my customer, like just um, catering to their needs. Like, um, of course, this is a hard time for all of us. But when someone does book me, I make sure to like um, I send them a um, a mood board. I send them this. I say, will this location work? I'm very hands on with them. Um, I would say before it was like you book me. I probably see you the day of the shoot. So mm -hmm. I just learned that where I can. I'm very hands on with the client. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, I think you definitely have to. I think this is like the year of fostering your relationships, like digging deep exactly. and on them. And Amani, like, how did you pivot that with the brands that you've worked with and pulled in for CultureCon? Did you have, like, how did you keep them on board, um, you know, just as your clients? And, you know, did you pivot them for this new project that you had launched? And how have you maintained those relationships strategically? in this one. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think for us, the beautiful thing is that we are a community first. And so out of the community, 
CultureCon was born, but before CultureCon, we were meeting up as a community. Um, and I think that's kind of always been our North Star is how can we first serve the community? And, um, you know, beyond CultureCon, we have a creative agency. And so we're doing uh, work with different clients throughout the year um, and they're pivoting with us. And so when we announced that we weren't doing CultureCon, kind of to your point, the first question was, okay, so like, what are you doing? Um, and I think for us, it was like, well, we got to figure that out. And so, um, you know, thankfully we have partners that we have very great relationships with. And to your point, they're deeper relationships. So um, we've done everything from virtual screenings to mailers. We just did um, this really cool mailer for I May Destroy You. That was all about kind of what self-care looks like. Um, so it's been really, I, I love that, that it's the year of the pivot because for us, it's kind of like, okay, you know, maybe this time we're not outside, but like, what can we work on? So we've also been working on our processes. So like, I love to hear that, like everything is streamlined. Everything has a process and a cadence and it just makes the machine. It just feels so much better. You get so much more sleep. There's accountability there. You know, who's responsible for what you move it over from the group chat to an email thread. It's just, um, we've just been growing substantially. And when it comes to kind of how we're working with different clients, it's really case by case because some clients want to do you know these huge layered interactive activations and some just want to host a virtual conversation and we're kind of a chameleon in terms of being able to do you know one to 100. And has your bottom line been impacted at all financially or do you feel like you've been able to sustain um you know your engine because i know we'll get into this conversation more about working with brands, especially during this political, social, and economic um, financially, officially, they're trying to tap in more Black creatives. You know, every I know our phones have been blowing up. Carol, you've obviously had a lot of inbound requests. So have you, Ashley. But how have you um, just held brands accountable? And has your bottom line been affected right now? Or do you feel like it's grown from a financial standpoint? I mean, we're but business is the same. I mean, it's hard, right? Because CultureCon is such a huge event that, of course, that's going to take. I mean, we had 40 sponsors for um, CultureCon New York. So, of course, you're going to feel that. But then you think on the other side, we're not renting out that huge warehouse. So on the other hand, it's like, oh, OK, so the overhead costs are going down. Um, so it's a little bit of both. Our team, um, every no one's had to been let go. We have a pretty robust team. Everyone's still in place, which I think is really great. Um, it's really just been kind of like, I think, thinking about what are all the things that we can offer? Because maybe in the past, we were limiting ourselves by only doing in-person events. Now with creative curriculum, you know, it doesn't replace CultureCon, um, it's in addition to. So in a way, we've kind of created this entire new platform that maybe would have taken a lot more time to create had we not had to create it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that specifically answers your question. I think for us, like, you know, especially everyone on this panel, like we were doing the work before it became trendy. So for us, when we get inbound requests, uh, the beautiful thing is that we really do kind of have the authority to kind of say, okay, this is how you're gonna present something to our community. And if it doesn't pass the smell test, we're like, oh, mm -mm. like trust us, you don't wanna give, like that's not how we would ever want to ingest this kind of content. So we have a lot of authority there and I think for us, it's also holding these brands accountable. That's like, we want a long relationship. You can't just come to us for a job posting. Like, let's really work together. And I think that's been working for us so far. Yeah, thank you for that. Because I think, you know, I feel like you made that sound so simple. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's not an easy thing to do to, uh, but I think like you've established an organization that is so, deep um, and aligned with your morals and values. It's so true to the community that you've been able to vet, you know, who do you actually want, really want to work with? Um, and I want to just turn it over to Arshley and Carol, you know, who are dealing with the, I mean, you're dealing with the community, but just from a client basis, how are you holding people accountable um, with the space that we're in and, and how is that going for you? Um, I think just being honest and being who you are, 
and you know coming with your guidelines and your boundaries beforehand because you know now with covid people say you know I, I want this that and third and they don't want to pay you what you're worth and so you have to be able to either accommodate or still you know set the boundaries um i think for us too what i've learned is just vetting people like there's there's jobs that i have to let go and i say hey you know you can call carol or phyllis or whoever photographer I feel like could do the job um, because now I'm looking at my brand as a brand. I'm like, I have to represent me and I have to represent my family, represent what we stand for. So there's certain things I won't take. So I think that's important too. So stay true to yourself and knowing what you want and what, knowing what you want to look like five years from now. And what do you want to look like five years from now? Corporation. <laughs> no, I want to, and listen, low, low key, I, I do want to be, um, someone who's influential, not just a filmmaker, but someone who makes a change and, and, and creates an impact. I want to have my own studio. I want to have Timber House Tech where we teach a group of kids in Atlanta or any inner city, and we teach them about photography, film, um, finance, you know, financial literacy. I, I want us to just be bigger than just a, you know, a camera. I want to use that as a weapon for sure to get us where we need to go, but uh, I definitely want to be more community-based if that's possible. Yeah. And Carol? So, um, uh, well, first I'll answer, I'm sorry. First I'll answer the question of where I wanna be in five years. I definitely want Color Work to be an agency. Um, I have like all my friends, all of you guys, I have so many creative friends who can just offer so many opportunities from um, DJ to artists to, you know, whatever you want. I have that group of friends, which is such a blessing. And I already do it now. I already like, you know, if that, if someone needs video, I tell them about Dr. Emil, but I want to have it in my company where I'm um, contracting these people out. So I definitely want to become an agency um, eventually. Um, but with, with clients staying true to myself, I, I honestly, I have not ran into an issue where someone's reached out to me and they did not fit what I'm doing really uh, with the, with pricing. I think my biggest pivot this year is payment plans because of COVID and people having different situations. I'm, I can do a payment plan for you. We can pay on it. And, and when you're finished, we can do the shoot. So I think that's the way that I've pivot for financially. I'm going to still that. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Though. She said, "When you pay it, then yeah, we do the show." I like that part. I'm like, okay. The process I use, Honeybook, it has it has a great way of breaking down the payment system, and once they pay it, it notifies you. It's incredible. So yeah, awesome. I hope people are taking notes about that. Um, cause I do think, you know, we're all eager to, to make our revenue goals each month, but I think accommodating and adjusting, um, you still get paid just maybe over some time. And so I, I see you guys have been pivoting a lot and I really just, has been on my heart, wanted to talk to you all about how do you, how are you still attaining your revenue goals, but still, how do you balance productivity and rest? You know, we're in this like grind culture now where we just, we love to work. We love to showcase that we work on IG. We love to showcase all the work we're doing, which is great, but we also need rest. And there's accounts like the Nat Ministry um, that is prioritizing rest and calling us to just grieve, you know, allow us to grieve what's been going on um, with Black Lives Matter and everything. Like even internally with family stuff, I think, you know, we've all experienced some type of grief and pain this year. So as an entrepreneur and leader, how has that been for you? And how, ha how do you find that balance? And what has been your mythology, if any? Um, and anybody can go. Yeah, I mean, I used to look at self-care as kind of its own sphere outside of who, what I was doing and the work that I was doing. And I think I've really pivoted to seeing self-care as a part of the whole. That when I'm not well rested, when I'm not feeling inspired, I'm not the best leader. I'm not the best version of myself. Um, and then I also think just like, just with all the recent, I don't know, 2020 has just been like, you, you're almost afraid to say it can't get any worse because then it's like, oh, you, oh, you thought. 
And I remember when Chadwick and passed away, you know, we were going to move my grandma and it just was so unbelievable that, cause I just felt, we all felt that he was just right there and then what he represented. And it just really reminded me of how fleeting time is and how we're all on borrowed time and that, you know, you wake up one day and you're 80 and you're like, okay, I'm finally going to rest. But like your whole life is already lived. And so I think for me, it's just like reminding myself that I don't have to participate in everything that the world says that we have to participate in. And that if you're not on Instagram for a weekend, at first you feel like you're missing everything just to realize that like, you miss nothing. Like the thirst traps are still there. And so for me, I just decide I decide now, you know, how I spend my time and I decide now like how much time I want to give to the algorithm. And I've just been so much happier. Like I've been down in Atlanta for five months at my parents' house and I, I, I couldn't be more well rested. to like go back to New York city, I feel like my best self. So I would just encourage anyone out there who's kind of like, I don't know, falling into the trap of the hamster wheel to just like take a beat and ask yourself if it's really serving you. Because if you're doing it all for the gram, like newsflash, you will be miserable. So I think that's what, what's been working for me. I can't sleep naturally. Um, there's always something in my head. I'm calling Tiffany or texting, what you doing? She's working too. So I'm, I'm a workaholic. I'm a recovering. I'm trying to recover. But um. I think for which what you said is is so true. We need that balance. And it's not necessarily social media for me. It's just always trying to pivot, always trying to go to the next level. And I've learned just through COVID, it's okay to not pick up the phone. It's okay to ignore that email and go up the mountains and go, you know, hang out with your family, go hiking. Um, so I think it's is it's important if like you said, if you want to be a leader, you want to be a filmmaker, a photographer, you want to be your best version of yourself, you have to take that rest. It's important. Um, but yeah, I'm, but I'm still struggling. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm still struggling. I still go to sleep at least at one o'clock. I used to go to bed at three, but I'm working on it. Well, I have no problem sleeping. <laughs> I'd probably go to sleep now if I wanted to, but, <laughs> but um, I would definitely say it's been a hard year. I mean, for several weeks, probably several months I woke up like I think the other day I woke up in tears um I mean it's, it's a lot going on I mean when chat when I found out about Chad I just sobbed I mean I was just like devastated and I think it's, it's just a combination of everything that's happening um but the way I've balanced rest is like I always have a lot going on like because I do graphic design as well I'm either working on a project a graphic design project or photography um and also working with friends like i i am a huge supporter of my friends like whenever they need help with something i'm there we support each other we ask each other questions so um that's involved too in my business and the way i rest is just pacing myself like when i do have a lot to do try not to be overwhelmed but just taking it one step at a time breathing through it and I also have blackout days, like on Saturdays where I don't pick up the phone. I don't look at any, you know, social media, any electronics. I just give time to myself. So. Y'all are so good. I think I'm like a hot mess over here because <laughs> I like to plan everything. Like I think um, for any of those who are like hyper planners, uh, I am that person where I even budget in my reading time, like my reading time when I'm gonna take a nap. I have that all budgeted out on my calendar, like an OCD crazy psychopath. And so my issue has been relinquishing that, you know, that obsession of having every single thing blocked out and just trying to learn how to go with the flow um, and sit with not having an immediate response versus always having a response. Like I have two planners, like, <laughs> you saw what I have? It's crazy, <laughs> kind of crazy. So um, I really needed to just hear that. Maybe that question was really for me. Um, but I also wanted just to ask you guys, like, how are you imagining Black futures and Black creativity during this time, not only for yourself, um, but for your business? And, you know, what do you hope for us? Because I, I feel like, you know, we're at a really interesting time as Black creatives where 
brands um, are demanding more of us or want to work with us more. Um, but we're also creating our own communities. Um, you see it, micro communities happening uh, all over the world. Um, you also see us going inward, like just the whole Black August campaign with the village market, all of these different things that have just been taken off. And how do you see that sustaining? And how do you, how are you imagining and thinking of Black futures as a creative? Yeah, like I'm really excited. Um, I'm really excited about it. I feel like the creative like ecosystems that we're building is really going to be foundational. I mean, a lot of our parents, you know, were just trying to like make the best for us, right? They all didn't have the luxury of like dreaming and being like, oh yeah, like I'm going to be this, you know, they really were um, just creating this foundation. I feel like our generation really kind of has this incredible opportunity to kind of like demand um, action and to kind of really see it through. And I don't know, I love the idea of like my friends putting me on, me putting my friends on, me working with a brand and hiring my friend who's also a really dope photographer. Like we're creating these ecosystems and um, you know, me and my friends at the Creative Collective, I think I get to see it every day because it really, we really were shooting in the gym and now we're talking to Will Smith at CultureCon. And so for us, like, I think it's incredible that there isn't any kind of like Wizard of Oz behind the curtain it's us, which is just, I think, beautiful to see it happen. And so I would love to see like more agencies and more of us like vouching for each other and sharing our rate cards and sharing, you know, what pricing looks like so that we can all level up together. But um, I think a lot of important conversations are taking place, this being one of them. And um, I don't know, I'm really optimistic. I see more Tyler Perry studios, you know, um, I see more, you know, um, artists doing things in terms of the political world. I, I see us just taking over if, if we're not already. Um, I love what you do, Imani. Um, I knew about you last year, I believe. I love I love what you do. And Carol, you know I love what you do. And I, I feel like there'll be more women who are at the front. And um, a, lot of, a lot of my business partners are women. And so I think we'll see more of that, which I'm looking forward to. Raising a daughter, that, that kind of excites me as well. So I definitely see us growing even in the communities where we don't have art, where schools are kind of leaving art behind because I'm an educator by trade. So I see art flooding into the school systems and, and you know, just fostering and nurturing these young black artists. And um, I don't know, I just I just see something, I can't really articulate it the way I want, it, want to, but I can just see us taking over. And I think it's about time they realize we're dope. Yes, I completely agree. I, I see us going um, going to the next level, especially the generation that's um, coming up after us. I mean, they are amazing. They're doing things that, you know, I don't think we thought of when we were 17 years old. Like, I want to give a shout out to um, Trini Simone of Black Vibe Tribe. She started her business at 14 years old. Um, now it's over six figures and she's 17 years old. She's making over six figures. Instagram just did, uh, um, uh, uh, they just featured her on the Instagram page. Um, and she's unapologetic about who she is, about her culture, about who, what she represents. She's not trying to whitewash it or cover it up. And I think a lot, um, we were successful in the past. Yes. But at a lot of times we still try to blend in. And I think the generation coming up after us, they're not trying to blend in. They're showing who they are and, you know, what they're doing. I think the next thing is we're going to be, you know, investing in economics. You know, um, Robert Smith, um, you know, he's doing great things like he has um, more of a financial business. I think we're going to go that route. Like a, a lot of things we're doing is great now, but I think we our next generation is going to go above us and it's going to be spectacular. So. And my last like, two questions uh, before we wrap up is I, I recently, I think it was on Amani's um, account, you recently said like, you know, you're not afraid to ask for help. Um, and I remember that has been my biggest challenge. I wrote it on a like sticky note and put it on my mirror so I could see it all the time. 
And so what has been like the one thing that you've had to kind of just ask for help on during this time that's helped you sustain and keep motivated? Um, and that's for everyone. Like, just say, hey, no, I need help with this. I actually don't know how to do this. Um, and, and it's helped you continue to sustain where you are. I would say for me, definitely it was um, the lifestyle photography. Um, I was just talking to a client the other day about um, posing like I'm not, you know, I'm the event photographer, so I'm capturing in the moment, you know, so that's a big part of who I am, which I still want to involve that in lifestyle, but just about being one on with one with that person, making sure like they turn their face this way or do that. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, Mecca Gamble, who is a phenomenal photographer, and you know, I ask her questions probably almost every day. <laughs> So, you know, um, and definitely my uh, my other friend, Marquita, who is an artist, um, she is so good and so um, gentle and so graceful with people. So and she actually did the shoot at Tila's with me. But um, so I've been reaching out to her and asking for suggestions. I mean, for me, gosh, um, I was holding on till the wheels fell off, man. I you talk about a workaholic. You guys wouldn't recognize me. I'm sitting here like, take rest, go to sleep. You wouldn't recognize me five months ago. All I did was work. All I did was turn down brunches. All I did was like create decks. It's like all I did. And then I got this chance and I was like, I might never get this chance again to try an entirely different lifestyle. So now I'm just like, I don't recognize myself. And so now I ask for help on everything because I realize that it, you really can't scale or be a leader if you're always in the weeds because people who are trying to help you will feel like, okay, then what am I here for? And you're also undermining their work. So it's like, you really have to just like, once you can like unleash that grip, it's like a wave of blessings fall over you. And yes, you spend that time to train them, but if you train them right, like it's just incredible what you can do and you can scale. We could never do a culture con. There's over 500 people that work on culture con. Like if I was trying to cut out every single card, it just isn't possible. So I think I had to ask myself like, okay, do you want to have it exactly how you would want to do it? Or do you want to reach more people in your community? And then when you put it like that, it's like, okay, I have to ask for help. So I ask for help now on like everything. If I look at a project, I bring people, I think I bring people in, excuse me, at the very beginning, and then I delegate the assignments. And it's just made a world of difference. Like Tiff, I go to sleep before midnight. You wouldn't recognize me. You wouldn't recognize me. So I highly suggest it. Uh, for, for me. Um, I think just taking advice from my mentors kind of helped me and, and helped me look at my business in a way where I'm like, okay, it's not about the money. I mean, money is good. We want to make the money, but you have to go back to the basics. Go back, um, go back to how you started. And I think people sometimes forget that doing stuff for free is currency too because you just never know who you're going to meet. You never know who they're connected to. And so I think that that – that's important to know. And I um, also got advice from Tiffany. Um, I'm always calling her, even if it's a, on Google Slides, something. I'm like, you know this? She, she always gives me advice. Carol, she knows. She waits like about a week to call me back. But <laughs> that's, my, that's my sister. That, that's my self-care. But I'm, I'm not even mad at She taught me that as well. Just you don't have to pick up the phone the moment it rings. So um, just taking advice from people, even, even my mom. She said, just take a break and enjoy enjoy the valley. Because that's where we're in right now. We're in a valley. And when, when we're out of this thing, I, I feel like we'll, we'll pivot even more. But you have to learn to rest and learn to take advice um, from those who know better. Yeah, and I was recently on a, this IG this morning. I saw Yusuf post. And I think that's what prompted my text to Imani earlier. Because um, I think like you, you forget that you have really like friends who do stuff really well. And there's areas that you don't do stuff well in. So for people out there, you know, definitely tap your friends. Like they're there to help too. They're there, there to have conversations. You know, I asked Imani um, a question today just about a certain part of my business model that I'm not doing the best at managing. And she she is. And I think, you know, sometimes I forget that I have friends in different states or cities as resources. Um, and it's not really my immediate network that is only going to help me, especially in the market that I am in to help me sustain and mobilize. So I think, you know, be creative about, you know, who you ask from 
ask for help from. You know, I think like you don't even realize that you have people that are so close to you um, beyond just the people you talk to every day. So uh, that's just what I want to drop. And then the last fun question that I have before we open up to questions is what has been your favorite quarantine snack? <laughs> it's not deep. <laughs> Mine's been ice cream cookies. I eat those like every other week. Um, That's sad. I can't really, I don't have a snack. No, I don't, I know. I'm not, yeah. I don't want to sound like an alky, but wine has been my favorite go-to. <laughs> wine and beer, IPA, just say it, but please don't judge me. No, no, it's a no judgment zone. I mean, mine's even, I don't know if mine's even worse because mine's not even a snack. It's like a full meal. Like I have been ordering Five Guys cheeseburgers, like, it's so bad. Like Uber Eats and Postmates know me so well that I just get notifications. They're like, oh, you haven't ordered today. Here's a code. And I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll use this too. So yeah, I love to eat. So I will, I guess mine's is like a sandwich. Like I've um, been making like grilled cheese sandwiches with, with jelly. <laughs> I didn't make real I didn't make it before, but now I love it. <laughs> and I would say, um, this is probably a horrible thing. And you know, I have vegan friends, you know. Um, I'm ashamed to say this. Say but it. I found out what butter was, and butter is pretty good. <laughs> well, you just found out. Wait, you just found out about butter? Yeah. Well, I didn't use I used to use like the olive oil spray and stuff on like when I cook my food. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, then this is your tribe. I will yeah. never shame you for butter. Oh my God. Yeah. I put butter on both sides of my croissant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling the vegan people right now looking at us like, look at these guys. Shame. They probably walked out. <laughs> I know. Well, any final words, uh, you all, before we open it up that you want to share to your creative community out there? Um, um, uh -huh. Go ahead. Well, I do have a final. I was I had wrote it down as part of my notes, but um, I've been. I think someone great to watch right now is Master P. I think everyone should follow Master P because he is phenomenal. He talks about economics. His biggest thing right now is get you some product because product doesn't talk back. He said he got people mad at him from twenty years ago. He said working with people is great, but it gets you some product because product's gonna make you money. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I would definitely say um, shout out to the nap ministry because I follow them too. get rest. Um, when you get up and you grind, just take the time. Don't feel like you have to go hard. You know, what's meant for you is meant for you. Just walk into it. It's already done. It's already, it's already, it's already written. Just step into it. So take your time, keep it simple and take plenty of naps. Yeah. I mean, I would echo both of those and just kind of say like, you know, it's cliche, but Rome wasn't built in a day. So start where you are and have tangible goals. When I first started, I was like, okay, we're gonna get 10 followers on Instagram today. We're gonna create a domain name. And then that builds over time and then you're able to really build a business. Well, thank you all so much for joining me on a Monday night. I was like, ooh, we have a panel on a Monday night. <laughs> I haven't done that in a long time. Um, but I'm really happy to just hear you guys like, you know, that was as much for me as I hope it was uh, for everyone else that attended. Um, and Brianna, I don't know if she's going to come back on, but yeah, I don't know if we have any questions, but just thank you all so much. And Monty, safe travel. I wish you all big, big wins this week. Big blessings. Good luck on all of your projects. You're going to kill it. Um, and yeah, be great. Thank you, Tiff. Welcome. All right, bye guys.